We are in Denmark Street, which has a rich music heritage that goes back decades. It's been a stomping ground for the Sex Pistols, Rolling Stones, and David Bowie lived in the van here for some time. In fact, the new venue we're going to see, the Lower Third, is named after his first band. We're here to visit Alternet London. It has two live music venues, a recording studio is being built, and it has this huge, dynamic, live space with 16K streams that's able to accommodate a myriad of events. I'm Carrie Goldberg. I'm one of the co-founders of OuterNet Venues, uh, which consists of here at OuterNet and the Lower Third. Uh, I started working on the project about two and a half years ago and worked with the big team to design and develop the spaces. Uh, I've had a long history in music venues, entertainment venues, and working with talent. What impact has this venue had, do you think, on this area and more broadly the, the um, live music industry? and, and live entertainment industry really. Yeah sure, so I think that since this venue has been announced a lot of people have said we've replaced what was the Astoria and the Marquee. Uh, there's nothing that's been in central London like you said since the 40s um, and so to be able to bring back something this large and purpose-built that can accommodate any kind of entertainment is really unique. Um, for the industry itself, a ton of jobs obviously in production, all the vendors that are coming in, but it's also given all the musicians and the promoters a chance to really um, work with a different kind of venue uh, and and to bring different audiences back to an area that has been sort of dead for a while. And you also have the Lower Third, which was the old 12 bar club. Yes. And that's obviously been completely refurbished, used elements of the original venue. Yes. But how important has it been to kind of recognize that heritage, really, when it comes to these, you know, these buildings that are amazing, they're, you know, beautifully, you know, futuristic. Um, but there, there is that heritage. I mean, how, how important has, has it been to incorporate that? So incorporating the history of Lower Third was, it was paramount to what we did there. We didn't want to touch any of the bones of the venue. We wanted to acknowledge its, its history, but to nudge it forward forward a bit. So in the Forge where the people like Adele and the Libertines had some of their first gigs, we've left that room virtually untouched but added a little bit of um, current production. So a little bit of a better stage, a better sound system and five or six nights a week it's programmed with you know new emerging artists but we have the likes of AEG and Live Nation putting in these up and coming um, uh, musicians and giving them a platform uh, to work from. We have lounges which sets up in there frequently to live stream the shows and then underneath it actually is the club room which holds 250 people, and that space wasn't available when the 12 Bar Club was there. So we've really expanded it now, and that is something that's programmed six, seven nights a week with a really broad and diverse range of music. So really bringing music back to Denmark Street, but specifically to the 12 Bar Club, we've been able to expand on its offerings in many ways with a great cocktail program. And obviously it's not just about live music, you know, the venue is able to accommodate all kind of shapes and forms of, of, of entertainment. What kind of, can you give me some examples of the array of, of, of shows and types of um, event you've had in here? Yeah, sure. So both venues, although very different, like you said, you know, you've got the historical 12 bar club, which is now lower third, and then here at OuterNet, um, are accommodating rap, hip hop, um, techno, We've got comedy, Ricky Gervais was one of our first nights when we opened here. We've had Chanel, we've had Ducati, Aston Martin, Amazon Wired. So it really touches a massive spectrum of entertainment. And both venues, while they're different sizes, have been able to do the same. So on Fridays and Saturdays, you'll always find great DJs playing in the venues. During the week, it'll be a mix of live music and then private corporate events. Sure, and are there occasions when you can actually make use of the space upstairs and sort of make it one big universal event across all, the whole district? Absolutely, so the reason I fell in love with OuterNet, the project itself, the district, was the ability to have a venue like this, but to play with pop-up shops, with a media buy, with Chateau Denmark, so you've got 55 room residence and hotel, two restaurants, so we have a massive media brand coming in, for example, next week that's taking over the entire district. They bought up both restaurants, they're using here, they're using the lower third, they're using the pop-up shops, and they're doing a big media buy. So historically for me and for all these brands, when you came in to book a venue, you had to then cherry pick and go to a neighbor and say, can I use your retail shop? Can I book the hotel that's near you? Can I buy out the billboards? Now you have one push button here where a brand can come in or an artist and they can dominate the entire district or parts of it. 
And how beneficial is it to really have that space upstairs that's open to the public? So people, you know, you walking around up there early on and it's kind of like a tourist destination. In fact, it, it makes a tourist of everybody that sees it in a sense, yes. because you can see their sort of wonder and awe as everyone stares around the screens and the way it's transformed within, within minutes. How beneficial is it you know, to have that kind of footfall, I suppose, upstairs. Well, having upstairs is paramount to everything that we do. So we can reach an audience of, what, 1.5 million people a week that come through there. So when brands are activating down here and they take screen time upstairs or a pop-up shop, they have an automatic footfall that's very hard to capture in other places. So tying those two pieces together, whether it's for a live music show where we can promote what artist is coming up, for example, Georgia Smith, she has two days coming up, and being able to promote that to 1.5 million people a week, um, there's very few places in the world you can do that. Um, and then just walk downstairs and see the show. So from a layman's perspective, I mean, walking around upstairs, I could obviously see where the load-in was and that's kind of a like flat floor from the street, you know, mm -hmm. great access. Um, you know, I look around and there's these amazing screens everywhere and you can see the PA system, but what are the kind of nuts and bolts? What are the kind of really headline aspects of the uh, spec? Sure, so one of the massive benefits we had in building here at OtterNet was that we weren't dealing with a listed building. So we could do a lot to the room that you couldn't do in other live music venues. Uh, massive custom acoustic treatment in here. So people like Ricky Gervais, when they come in working in, in theaters, they're used to those kind of dead rooms. We were able to do that, achieve that with the walls. New DMB sound system, so we were one of the first to install it uh, in the UK. We've got completely modular staging, so anyone that comes whatever staging spec they need, we're able to accommodate that. Uh, the largest indoor screen in the UK. So again, this is typically brands or artists would have to pay to bring this in, but this is a permanent infrastructure. And then from there, you know, the room is completely versatile. So we tried to address a lot of the things, the pinch points that venues have, whether it's not enough toilets or um, too short, small of bars. We were able to put in massive bars with a ton of stations, more toilets than we needed. So hopefully we would address some of those pain points that a lot of the venues um, aren't so fortunate to be able to move walls uh, in the list of buildings. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Goodwin. I'm the Chief Content and Strategy Officer here at the Outernet. I've been in my role for six months now. Uh, my role encompasses commercial, business, and editorial strategy to make the Outernet the greatest entertainment district London's ever seen. Outernet London has transformed this area of, of the city that's always been historically important for live music. It's, you know, had the Sex Pistols staying here. Barry used to live in a van, I understand, on, the, on Denmark Street just there. And um, yeah, Siggy. Um, but it's, it's, it's almost turned into a kind of scene from uh, Blade Runner, you know, it's, it's amazing um, what you guys have done. How has the, um, the, the, the idea and the, the kind of, how's it come to life in the, since it opened? In well, I think for, first and foremost, you know, get, given that credibility aspect that, you know, Tin Pan Alley, Denmark Street, which we're 20 meters from, has long been the, the center part of music and culture uh, in, in London, if not globally. The idea of then reinterpreting that for the 21st century is absolutely what the internet is. A space where you can perform music, do live events, immersive events, even corporate events. Doing that whole range of activity in central London is really the heartbeat of what the internet is about. Absolutely, and you've got these amazing spaces. Um, you can just talk me through those spaces in a moment, but they're using 16K technology wrapped right around the visitor. Um, can you talk me through some of the ways that the spaces are being used and what, what the capacities of those spaces are? Sure. So adjacent to what we've got downstairs, which are two really amazing uh, event and gig spaces in the here building and the lower third, upstairs we have three or four even amazing opportunities for brands, advertisers, uh, and clients alike to come in and create outstanding immersive content on the biggest screens you've ever seen at 16K. I, I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but bigger is better for sure with what we're talking about here, proven scientifically. So if I've never experienced this building, this space, this district before, out and out, how would you describe it? Well, it's definitely an entertainment district. It comprises of a hotel, two restaurants, two amazing gig spaces and event spaces downstairs and upstairs, the biggest screen in Europe at 16K. It's an extraordinary collection of assets that can contribute to amazing entertainment for the public, but also 
increasingly amazing immersive opportunities for brands in the retail entertainment space. So in this district, you've got quite an amazing kind of combination of futuristic spaces upstairs that are open to the public. And then downstairs, you've got two vibrant live entertainment venues. Um, Lower Third, which is, uh, I believe, a nod to Bowie's um, previous That's band. <laughs> yeah. and, and here. Um, can you kind of talk us through how these spaces have been used since the, the, um, this whole district opened? Well, I, I think in a couple ways. Uh, one, for you know, amazing music uh, gigs and also other entertainment opportunities. We've hosted you know, press conferences before boxing fights, stuff like that. But then also we scale that into events for corporates. So we've done you know, a range of different away days for different companies. So those are all very, very private. But then we also do these amazing connected private and public events where downstairs you've got you know, a couple hundred people here as a ticketed event. They're spending the day talking about maybe energy tech. And upstairs, we're echoing what's happening downstairs. So you've got, again, private downstairs with the public opportunities upstairs, thus really supercharging our clients' messages by using these different venues and screens within the district. And obviously, it's got a studio here as well. I mean, Denmark Street traditionally had all sorts of musical businesses, including a studio. Um, so how important is it to kind of be a hub of creativity, oh, not yeah. just to reflect the creativity, yeah. but actually be a home to its creation? So the fir first step was getting the internet built and open, which uh, as you've seen by the screens and the spaces was not a small undertaking, given as well that the Elizabeth line is six feet under uh, the spaces. So an inc incredible engineering event that took place to build this. But now as we're open and been open for six months and have great traction with brands and audiences alike, 1.5 million people a week are now visiting the piazza of the district, extraordinary number. Now, to your point, it's all about building IP. And we've got an extraordinary setup downstairs where we're building a new music studio. Uh, that will help us to start attracting bands and artists to come in and create. But then also looking at using the district to create district-wide entertainment events. The first one, it will be a Priscilla, kind of a Priscilla party, not unlike what's happening in Mamma Mia out at the O2 in the East End, but in central London, making it far cooler. Just kidding, I love Mamma Mia, it's all good. But that's really the starting point. You know, we want to, alongside of providing a free space for uh, thousands of people to come to each day to enjoy our content, we also want to start building up our own intellectual pro property, our own set of shows that can really, you know, exploit this amazing opportunity we have. So that's it from Outfit at London, a truly transformative space that's created an entertainment hub right in the centre of London.